Welcome to the Undisputed Podcast. I'm your host, Jenny Taft. This podcast is the full show from today's episode of Undisputed from start to finish. We've got a busy slate, so skip Shannon. Let's get to it. It's Friday here on Undisputed, and I always wear all black on Friday. And I always wear the chain that my friend Little Wayne gave me. So today it is goat on top of goat. As you can see, it's Wayne on top of Jordan. And maybe today is the day on Undisputed that I finally convince my man, Shannon Sharp, that his man, LeBron James, will never, ever be Michael Jeffrey Jordan. So I say good morning and good luck to my man, Shannon Sharp. How are you? I'm doing well. And you always lose because you always... Because, Skip, what happened is that you picked the wrong side to stand on. You got the Cowboys, you got a 43-year-old Tom Brady, and you took you took the second win. best player of all time. How can you win those arguments? Mm, that sounds like a Lose. whole swimming pool, a diet mountain duel. So <laughs> we are about to catch fire here over the next two hours on this show as Shannon and I get into it over LeBron's latest tweet, shake my head, and Mike Leach's <laughs> deleted tweet, shake my head over that one, and over why yes. Shannon still believes that Tua is a better bet than Joe Burrow? Uh, yeah, I don't know about that one. And over Fox Bet, setting the over-under on Cowboy wins for next year at nine and a half, only nine and a half. And finally, we'll wrap it up today with Tom Brady doing something he never would have done under the Bill Belichick rule, the iron hand of Belichick, and that's doing the <laughs> Howard Stern show next week. We'll talk about that. But first up, here on Undisputed on this Friday... This is a Dallas Cowboy stunner for me. This is Des Bryant, the ex-Cowboy, <laughs> tweeting this. Dak and myself just finished a great workout session. Picked up where we left off. Uh, last time I checked, where they left off was a 2017 <laughs> in which they weren't very good together. And that's the last time Des Bryant played in an NFL football game. And Des also posted a picture of himself and Dak and a couple of other receivers at the workout with their arms all draped around each other. We'll get to that in just a second. But Shannon, I'm going to let you go first on this as always. What do you make of all this? You talk about the photo? Or are we going to let's start with the photo first, Skip? Skip, why it, is it so hard? All of all Skip, of the above. Watch. Yes. Skip, Skip, they watch TV. They see where this thing is heading, and they still. So I just want people to understand, say, and I hope nothing, you know, they don't contract this virus and get ill, but you're, you're putting yourself in harm's way, and you keep, you keep doing it. It's okay. If you want to work out with the guy, just don't do that because it shows that you have a blatant disregard for what's going on in our country. <clears throat> Skip. <laughs> Dak said, that Dak, Dez tweeted that photo out and put, we picked right up where we left off. Skip, let me refresh people how they left off. Skip, did you know Dak's last year with Dez was his worst in terms of completion percentage, yards per attempt, and interception? And it was his second lowest QBR ever. That's picking up right where they left off. A lot of Dak's interception was because Dez was not getting separation. And he was forcing the ball to Dez because that's what Dez had to become accustomed to with Tony Romo. Because he wasn't technically sound, he couldn't get in and out of break, Skip. Just throw it up and I'll make a play for you. Well, in the process of doing that, Dak was putting the ball in harm's way and it was getting intercepted and everybody was looking at Dak crazy. Well, uh, this is what Jerry, this is what Jason Garrett says, this is how Dez made his bones in the NFL. This is what I'm going to continue to do. Now, Skip, the guru, Will McClay, who's done the lion's share of the drafting, who's put this team together, this is what he said when they released Dez Bryant and the reason for why they released Dez Bryant. He said it was his inability to win one-on-one -on -one and consistently win downfield. There were some other inconsistencies in his game. We felt best moving forward it was to be without Dez Bryant. 
That's what Will McClay said two years ago and before the Achilles injury. So let me put, let me, let me, let me uh, process this. Let me try to visualize this. Dez has never been a burner. Dez has never been technically sound as far as route running. When we think of route running, we don't think of Dez Bryant. So two years, not a route runner, Achilles injury, and now he's going to come back. <laughs> and he's talking about playing the role that ran the car. Skip, the things that se- separates the top three receivers, I like Julio, some people like Mike Thomas, some people like DeAndre Hopkins. They move left, right, slot, motion. When have you ever known Dez Bryant to play mainly the slot? Because that's what Randall Cobb did. Because that's the role he wants to fulfill. What has happened, Skip, is that Dez says, Jerry, you gave Jason Witten an opportunity to come back after being away. Give me that same opportunity. That's what this is about, Skip. See, Dez could not process. Dez could not, re- Skip, his heart was broken when the Cowboys moved on. That's why he turned down that three years, $21 million from the uh, uh, from the Ravens because he could not get out of his mind. It was like, if I'm not in this blue and silver, if I don't have 88 and the star on my, on my helmet, Skip, I'm not Dez. I'm nothing. And now he wants to come back. Skip, I wish him well. I just don't think it's going to turn out well for, for him or the Cowboys. Hmm. Unfortunately, you make way too many good points. But I'm going to refute your final takeaway. But before I get to that, Mr. Sharp, I need to echo your sentiments about said posted picture. We talked about one yesterday on the show posted by Lamar Jackson with Antonio Brown, Marquise Brown, the cousins, the workout in Miami. I, I just cringe and I wince when I see these pictures posted, the Dak Dez picture. And again, echoing all of your sentiments from the bottom of my heart. Feels like <clears throat> this country's at war right now with a runaway virus, a disease. And I just wish our athletes, our superstars, could set a better example by not posting these pictures. Everybody's under stay at home orders, everybody's trying to do their part to defeat this runaway virus. And here we are having to open our show on a Friday on Undisputed, asking athletes to please stay home and stay out of posting pictures after workouts in which you're throwing sweaty footballs, catching sweaty footballs. Again, I'm sure it's going on behind closed doors everywhere. I'm not even gonna doubt that Tom Brady is somewhere right now throwing passes to Mike Evans Chris Godwin, but they're not going to post about it because they're going to do it in in their own confines behind closed doors. And, and maybe there's a way to do that safely. But Shannon, to your point, you're sending such a bad message to everybody who's trying to do their part as an American to stop Correct. the spread of this virus in America. And they need to look no further at the invincible athletes who started the dominoes falling. Rudy Gobert, I will always remember now as the the first sort of victim of coronavirus, right? And he Mm -hmm. scoffed at it. Remember he did the press conference where he was laughing at the, 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 even the possibility of this virus spreading and he's touching all the reporters' microphones and making a joke out of it. And, And he looked about as bad as you could ever look. And then obviously it's Donovan Mitchell, his teammate, then it's Kevin Durant getting the virus, and then it's Sean Payton and on and on. So I just ask our athletes, if you need to work out in privacy and secrecy, that's fine. Just don't post it. It's just a bad look. Okay, so we got that off our chest. We're both at home today doing the show, and we don't want to be at home. We'd much rather be, uh, I'm about a two minute drive from the Fox studios. I'd rather be there right now and I miss it dearly. And maybe sometime sooner than later, we'll be back there if everybody will do their part. But now back to Des Bryant. Shannon, Mm -hmm. I, I still believe, as crazy as it sounds, there could be some place for Des to return to the Cowboys in a very limited role, in dare I say, a humbled role, even after two years and an Achilles tear that cost him his shot 
with Sean Payton in New Orleans and Drew Brees because they signed him nine games into that season after he was cut. And you know what happened? Two practices in, he tears his Achilles tendon. So I, I still believe Dez loves Dallas enough that he would, if he would take another one of those bargain basement deals, that Jerry loves him enough. And apparently, I, I didn't know Dak even liked him. Th this was a big message sent from Dak Prescott. And he knows full well what will happen if you post a picture like this. He knew Dez was going to post it. That the message will be sent to Cowboy Nation. I I'm still good with him. So could Dez come back and at least play a, a quasi-Jason Witten role as the third and three receiver or the red zone receiver, the, the third and goal from the four receiver who might be able with, with his big body just to bounce somebody off like Jason used to do, sort of shield somebody off, wall somebody off, and make a big catch for three or four yards that would give you a first down or a touchdown. That, that's all I'm looking at here. And it, it seems like Jerry and Stephen Jones and even now Dak Prescott are open to that. How would you, what, what do you think of that role? Skip, I remember his last year there in Dallas. You said, I am ready for this to end. I am, I'm done with I Dez did. Bryant. He was my favorite player. Done. I used to throw up the X, done. but I am done with Dez. He can't run. Dak throws the ball to him. It's getting picked off. We shot we the hot skip. You remember what happened in Denver? 102 yards by Keith to leave the other way. You remember what happened in Seattle? You remember it was time after time after time. Normally when, Dez, when mm -hmm. Dak threw the ball to Dez, bad things normally happen. It's hard for me to believe, having played this game, and I like to think I played at an elite level. Skip, you do not get faster. You do not get better as you start to age, especially if you were slow to begin with. And that's what that, that Skip, it wasn't like Dad was, was, was a, 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 a Tyreek Hill speed, and now all of a sudden he's, you know, above average NFL speed. He was average to begin with. Now he's below average. Yep. He's heavier. He was never technically sound. We don't look at him and say, oh, man, that's a Mari Cooper out there running rocks like that. That's a Julio running rocks like that. That's a, you know, one of these elite receivers that can run rocks. That's not how we looked at Dez. We've always looked at Dez as a big physical receiver that was, that was plus 50% on the jump balls. Then it became, Skip, he was less than 50% on the jump balls, and that was really all they could throw him. So I just don't, I, let's skip, I get it. He wants to come back. He wants to play. He didn't want his career to end like that. But Skip, let me ask you a question. Okay, he comes back and plays that role. There's the, the narrative has already been set. Dad, you had eight, nine years that to, to fix this, to work out there like you're working out now with Dad. I mean, Dad, you should have been working on your rock running skills like that. Those are things you should have done in the beginning. But see, it's always, Skip, you know why I was able to walk away, Skip? Because I had to put all that time, I had done everything I possibly could to get something out of my career. So I was able to walk away head, head held high. That, Dad, excuse me, I keep saying Dad, that Dad feels that he's missed out on something. Skip, time is the one thing that you cannot recapture. It's gone. Once it's gone, if you lose money, Skip, you can make that up. Relationship, you fall out of love, you might find someone you loved even more than the person you thought you couldn't live without. But time, once it's gone, there is no recapturing it. Dad, you're not getting that time that you lost. I don't know what you're doing in the offseason, but there's a lot of things that you should have been doing that you weren't doing. And it's gone. So I wish him well, Skip. Hey, come back out there. Because, but you know what? He's in the right place because Jerry Jones is just foolish enough to sign Dez Bryant. And thank you for bringing that up. To your point, <laughs> remember when Jerry did his big media session at the Combine, sitting on his big Dallas mm -hmm. Cowboy touring bus with the media gathered inside the bus, out of nowhere, Jerry suddenly said, I've been thinking about <laughs> shower. It should not be dismissed, said Jerry Jones. I'm thinking about it. So Jerry's saying, when I'm in the shower, my mind is wondering to, should we bring back Des Bryant? And the reason he was even thinking about it is because Stephen Jones said that Des had been texting him, I'm yours. I, I'm ready to come back. 
at, at, under whatever circumstance, under whatever condition, I'll be a Dallas Cowboy. Well, obviously, they're now in the mode of bargain basement signings. They still haven't secured Dak. They got the, the franchise tag on him, obviously, but they're trying to, to frantically get that deal done long term with Dak. They overpaid for Amari because they were almost forced to to keep him $100 million. They've overpaid a lot of Dallas Cowboys. Demarcus Lawrence, obviously, a year ago, you can argue the offensive line. You could even argue Jalen Smith if you so desire. No, but no, no. Because of that, no, they they've, ne- they've made a lot of s- overpay who? They didn't overpay. Hold on, Skip. You just told me. Remember that anonymous GM yesterday? Say we're not supposed to evaluate players on 2019. So DeMarcus Lawrence, Jalen Smith, that offensive line, we're not going to evaluate them on that. We're going to evaluate them on their best seasons like we do Tom Brady. (laughs) Okay, but time out. You're misinterpreting what the the anonymous quote was yesterday. He said, if you think that what you saw from Tom last year was decline, you're way off base. So he was evaluating Tom last year with no help around him saying, I'm evaluating that guy as, as losing none of his skills at going on age 43. Now, back to this point. The Dallas Cowboys are now in the mode of making bargain basement deals, and they've made a whole bunch of them. Gerald McCoy, Dontari Poe, and, and obviously Alden Smith came out of nowhere, out of left field, but they got him for a $2 million mm-hmm. base, and they could cut him and have, have no liability there if they so desired. And then obviously Randy Gregory Correct. could come back if, in fact, he could get reinstated along with Alden Smith. And here we go now with Dez. It, you, you could get him on a minimum deal. He got his big contract, you recall, after the 2014 season going into 2015. So he got paid by Jerry. Mm-hmm. And now Jerry's thinking, well, I could bring him back in a limited role. Jerry loves him, obviously. Da- I mean, Dez loves the Dallas Cowboys. He's from Lufkin, Texas, grew up a huge Cowboy fan. So I'm getting desperate. I admit it because they're strapped against the cap because they still don't know how much D- Dak is going to cost in the end. And for Dak to send this social media message via Dez, I- hey, I'm kind of greasing the skids here. I'm opening the door. I'm replanting the seeds. I, I'm saying let's clear the decks to bring back Des Bryant because we may need him if, in fact, we don't land a receiver in the draft. I don't know. Mel Kuyper has C.D. Lamb fallen to the Cowboys. I, if that happens, I'd be like, "Thank you, God," and there'd be little to no need for Des Bryant. But I'm not <laughs> sure that's going. I'm not sure C.D.'s going to last to the, their pick at number 17. So what I'm saying is, I, I look at. 2016, which was Dak's rookie year, and and he and Dez were pretty good together all the way up to that that frantic, epic comeback against Aaron Rodgers in the playoff game. And in that game, Dez Bryant caught nine balls for 132 yards. That worked. But then to your point, 2017 was an absolute start-to-finish disaster for Dez and Dak because They displayed little to no rapport, wavelength, chemistry. They were just never on the same page. Dez had career lows in every category across the board. He was second in the league in drops. His his, uh, receptions to drop rate was 13.8%, which was second worst among the 36 with 100 plus targets. So you can just see he was at the bottom of the barrel of receivers in the league in the last year that we saw him. But again, he got humbled. He, he, he got pushed out the back door. He tore his Achilles tendon. And, and he's had to sit home on his couch tweeting about pro football instead of playing pro football. And then we did get to see him, as you recall, Shannon, Patrick Mahomes blessed him by asking him to come to a workout in Fort Worth where Patrick was always trained in the offseason. He was throwing him passes. I thought he looked okay. You thought he looked slow. But, but I thought in the Patrick Mahomes video that I saw, Des looked okay. His body looked okay. He didn't look fat. He, he didn't look completely out of shape. He looked pretty good to me. So I'm starting to think that they're desperate enough that they think they might need Des Bryant in some kind of limited role to help replace almost Jason Witten more than Randall Cobb. Your thoughts? But Skip, here's, Skip, here's the thing. They could have... 
Do you believe that Dez Bryant would have restructured his contract? They flat out released it. No restructuring, no minimum deal. They flat out released it. Skip, if they don't, you could have had him at a discount then. Because remember, he was available. He was there. Normally what happens when we want a guy and, and we want him on a reduced salary, we come to you. We says, okay, this is what we're looking to do now. We need some cap space. We want you, but we can't pay you the salary that you're scheduled to make. Would you be willing to restructure at a lower rate? The player can either say yay or nay. They didn't even ask Daz, Daz this. They flat out released him. Skip, in their last year together, Skip, that Daz combo ranked last in passer rating, second worst in completion percentage among the 26 combos that had at least 100 targets. But they picked right up where they left off. Let that sink in. He said they picked right up where they left off, and they were the worst of 26 combos that had at least 100 targets. Okay, you got me on that. But what I'm trying to say is <laughs> the Cowboys are in more of a desperate mode than they've been for several years. And the point is, the desperation has actually helped them upgrade on defense. I know they lost Byron Jones, and I know they lost Jeff Heath, and I know they lost Robert Quinn, and on and on and on. But the upgrades at low money, yeah, I didn't even mention Ha Ha Clinton Dix at safety, who's a much better cover safety than Jeff Heath ever dreamed of being. So the, the defense, <laughs> it's, gotten, it's gotten a little older, but it's gotten a little better. And I like the fact that, that they have the new coordinator, Mike Nolan, and, and Mike McCarthy's new mindset, I promise you that defense will be better than last year when it was pretty sorry, pretty, pretty consistently. The offense last year, Shannon, I remind you, it led the whole league in yards gained. But it's a little worse mm -hmm. right now because Travis Frederick is gone. The Pro Bowl, who was gonna, he was on a Hall of Fame arc and obviously he had his immune deficiency syndrome that he was fighting, and God bless him, he had to retire. So it's a huge loss in the middle of that right. line. I thought the line declined a little bit last year. And then Randall Cobb, who had a very good year on a bargain basement deal of $5 million a year, got $9 million a year for three years guaranteed to go to Houston because they were so desperate after they gave away DeAndre Hopkins. So that was a big loss in the slot. And I don't have an answer there. I'm, I'm not sure where to go there. Again, they kept Amari. Gallup was emerging as a star last year. Amari, I, I'm not a big fan because he's, he's home versus road. He's not a road warrior. You know what happened. He got 53 right. balls at home and 27 balls on the road. And he took himself out of the game immediately at the Jets, and they lost by two. And he took himself out of the game because Stephon Gilmore was whipping him up in New England. It was just pathetic. <laughs> and then he got taken out of the game late in Philadelphia. He got benched because he was running half-hearted routes and just breaking off routes because he was losing heart against the Eagles at Philadelphia in a game in which Dak was trying to play with a bum shoulder. So I don't have great respect anymore for Amari. And so I'm saying, well, at least Dez is a gamer. You know, at least he's got a big heart. At, at least I saw flashes in 2016 of a Dez-Dak rapport and combination. So I'm saying Skip, that was maybe, four years ago. maybe this could be... Okay, but, but Alden Smith was five years ago, and we're taking a shot at him. Exactly. And, you know, Dad, Randy exactly. Gregory was three years ago, and we're probably going to take a shot with him. What, what else am I supposed to say? <laughs> I, I got nothing. Hey, we'll, we'll be the freshest team in pro football. Everybody's going to be fresh because nobody will have played for several years. So the NFL better <laughs> get ready. We're ready to play 32 games in the regular season next year because our guys haven't played for several years. I, I cannot believe this. My partner, my homie, Skip Bayless, is pinning his Super Bowl's hopes and aspirations on guys that have not been good for five years, for four years, for three years. Really, Skip? If this is what you're pinning your hopes on, is this what you're pinning going to Tampa on guys that have not played good or played at all in a very, very long time. Please tell me that's not true. Please tell me there's something else that you're holding out for. I never said my team is going to Tampa next year. 
I made the mistake of jinxing my team a year ago saying they were going to Miami, which would have been your worst nightmare because that was a Fox Super Bowl and we were there on South Beach <laughs> all week long and it was a great week. But my Cowboys were not there. They were nowhere to be found because I jinxed them a year ago and I'm not going to do it again. You have not heard one word come out of my mouth about the Cowboys winning the NFC. Now, maybe the NFC East? I don't know. Maybe, I don't know. We're going to talk about it in a few minutes here. Again, Fox Bet sets the over-under on their wins at 9.5, nine and a half. Could they get to 10 wins and be a wild card team under the new playoff yeah. format? Even you have admitted yeah, under the yeah. new playoff <laughs> format with a seventh seed on each side, maybe my Cowboys eke in the back door with the number seven seed. That's fine with me. Just get us in the tournament because by then, Dez and Alden and Randy Gregory may be getting back into the rhythm of playing pro football after all those years off. And maybe they'll be more will ready and willing and able to contribute in the postseason than in the regular season. So I'm not saying Super Bowl. I'm a little desperate, and I'm admitting to you, I see glaring holes because I see overpay, 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 and they're about to have to overpay for Dak Prescott because he hasn't earned a Patrick Mahomes kind of contract just yet. I hope he will someday, but not yet. And he and his agent are holding out, not literally, but figuratively, for $40 million a year. And I just don't think he's worth that much, and neither at this moment does Jerry Jones. You're talking about you, you're not going to mention anything about Super Bowl. They're not going to the playoffs. We're going to talk about that a little later, too. Okay. Well, do we have do on that, as in Diet Mountain Dew? No, 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 no. I've no, got a no, swimming pool no, out back no. here full of Diet Mountain Dew, thanks to Shannon Sharp. Because I believe it was Jerry Jones that really that put the pressure on, we need to add an extra playoff team because it would have been him. He would have benefited. He would have benefited the most from all those okay. eight and eight, nine Maybe and seven so. seasons for possibly having another I team know. get into the playoffs. Okay. Well, at least we got rid of old eight and eight Garrett, old Coach Clapp. He's out the back door, finally. It was way too long for that. He should have been fired in 2012. But at least I see a ray of hope. I see Mike McCarthy. <laughs> I, I, I see... I see potential to at least make the playoffs next year, which did not happen last year. So let's change the subject, shall we? No mercy. I shook my head over this tweet from LeBron James, and I'm assuming Shannon Sharp probably shook his fist. Yes. Here's the tweet from LeBron. Thinking about maybe sitting down and breaking down some of my most memorable games and moments in my career, maybe IG live it or just film it and hold on to it for another time, followed by thinking emoji. Hmm. Shannon Sharp, I'm going to assume you love this tweet. Am I right about that? Love it. But you know what I have a problem? The problem that I got with you, Skip Bayless, you had no problem with Tom versus time. What was that about, Skip? You see, and now what you're trying to do, you're going to say, oh, because Jordan, uh, 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 ESPN is doing this documentary on Jordan. I don't want to see him, you know, uh, uh, li uh, uh, IG live it. Put it in a documentary. That's what I want to see. I want I want to hear I want to hear LeBron. I want to see him talk about the moment uh, game six in Boston in the Garden. I want to hear scoring 25 mm. straight points. What's going through his mind against the bad boy Pistons, too? To break up their run, their stranglehold on the Eastern Conference. I want to hear his last year in Cleveland, the series in Indiana against Toronto, against Boston. I want to hear that. You see, the problem is, is that because Jordan, they're doing this documentary on Jordan, everybody, oh, see, Brown would be just scared. Other athletes have done documentaries before Jordan. You see, you can't do anything. If you dress nice after a game, well, they see how Jordan did it. Jordan dressed nice. Well, if you got a tennis shoe, Jordan had a tennis shoe, so everybody, stop this. Of course, yes, Jordan was one of the first athletes to be a major brand in Dorsey and have a shoe line 
and was well spoken and presentable at the uh, 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 for press conferences. And he was always suited and booty. Yes, but he didn't patent it. That doesn't mean so someone else can't look nice and have a shirt and tie on at press conferences or after the game. It doesn't mean no one else should be allowed to get a sneaker line because Jordan got one and they're never going to be able to outsell Jordan. And, man, stop this. Yes, Bron, don't shortchange the people. Don't do this thing, IG Live. And screw it, Skip. Do you realize that LeBron James has come up in the social media era? There are a lot of great players that we talk about. There was no daily debate talk shows. We didn't have to worry about every dribble. We didn't have to worry about every possession, every missed shot, every misspoken word. That's what LeBron has had to deal with since the time he was 17. And he's plastic, passed it with flying colors. I want a documentary, docuseries, docuseries, docuseries. Okay. Point number one, Michael Jordan didn't commission the documentary that's about to air on ESPN called The Last Dance, and they've moved up the airing of it, as you know, from June to April, in part because all of us right. are stuck at home right now where we should be. But that's <laughs> not Jordan's doing. That's ESPN's doing. That's the documentary makers doing. Jordan didn't say, I think it's time for me to do a documentary on myself. No, somebody else did it because somebody else is always documenting Michael Jordan's greatness. Look, Shannon, I, got, I, I get tired on this show. I, I get wrung out from having to criticize LeBron, but he's always asking for it. I, I don't enjoy it. I didn't want to do it today until I saw this tweet last night. And my first thought was, from my heart, LeBron, this is so beneath you. You're so much greater than this. This reeks of insecurity. This, this reeks of somebody who's not sure how great he is. Somebody who has to keep reminding us how great he has been so that maybe we forget those many moments when he wasn't great. And, and again, Michael Jordan, while he was playing, would have never, again, there was no social media, but he would have never gone to the media and said, but, you know, guys, I, I'm thinking about doing a documentary on myself talking about all my greatest moments and breaking them down for the world to hear and see. No, that's pathetic. That would have been so beneath him because, Shannon, in the end, LeBron, you play, we rank. You play and we chronicle. You play and we break it down. We put it into context historically. We, we don't need you to do that because you're better than that. You're greater than that. And it, it reeks of somebody who says, hey, remember when I did that? I know you might have forgotten, but then remember when I did that and that and that? Because he wants to, us to forget his so many epic fails. He wants us to forget what happened in that last series against the Boston Celtics before he took his talents to South Beach when his owner accused him of quitting when he shrank in games four, five, and six against the Celtics, and they lost in six. And LeBron wants us to forget about that all-time superstar meltdown that he suffered in games four, five, and six in his first finals against Dallas with the Miami Heat. And he wants us to forget what happened down the stretch of game six in 2013 when he just he, he crumbled under the pressure to beat my Spurs. He oh. had three uncharacteristic, unforced error turnovers in the last three minutes. He missed uh, an air ball three, and then he labricked a three that, that was to tie and long rebound out to Chris Bosh, to Ray Allen, who saved his legacy from being two and seven in the finals right Please, now. You. And LeBron wants oh. us to forget the 2014 finals when he shrank in games three and four back in Miami when it was tied one to one and they got blown off the floor. The Heat did by a record finals margin. And LeBron wants us to forget what happened at the end of game one at Oracle a couple of years ago when 
He just quit on his team and pouted into overtime, sat apart from the team during the timeout before the overtime, and wouldn't shoot for the first two and a half minutes of the overtime as they lost by seven because J.R. Smith committed a mental blunder. And it was LeBron who passed up the last shot in favor of passing, as you remember, to George Hill. It, it's, it's like one disaster after another wow. after another. Wow. And I, I don't want to hear about the greatness. I, it, it's, you know, let yes, us you do. do that. Yes, you do. I, I just think. No, 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 then you can no, do No, I don't. Shannon. You know, it was just a year ago. Yep. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. Go ahead. I want to hear you say, it was just a year ago what? What happened? It was just a year ago that the great LeBron James, the GOAT, as you call him, came to Los Angeles mm -hmm. in his first year with the Lakers. Yeah. And they had a lot of good young players on that team. And LeBron, when he was healthy, went 28 and 27 as a starter, and and mm -hmm. created not a documentary, but a blooper reel of lowlights. And just because LeBron tweeted this, I'm sorry, I, we've got to show it again just one more time. No, we don't have because to. Because if we could see what happened, remember the, the pass inbounds at Phoenix? He throws it in, and it, and it hits the backboard. What are you doing, LeBron? And then remember what happened at Memphis? Kyle Kuzma had to shove LeBron out to guard his man at the three-point line because he wasn't playing any defense. Come on, LeBron, you're better than that. Kyle Kuzma, who doesn't play defense himself. And then remember when he rolled the ball up the floor and he rolled it and he rolled to save time and he gets it to the other end and just kicks it out of bounds. Blooper. And then the all-time blooper was at Madison Square Garden, the house he should own, the house that MJ owned. And Mario Hazonia blocked his last second shot. Hazonia? Now with the Portland Trailblazers, then with the Knicks. Okay, it's just blooper. And that's that's just the tip of that iceberg from last year, Shannon. That and yeah. now you're telling me, oh. you know, I'm thinking about sitting down and breaking down all my greatest moments. Stop it, LeBron. That's pathetic. Beneath you. Skip, if you don't mind me asking, who commissioned Tom versus Time? He did. Why would he do that? Tom Brady, it's not your job. It's our job to tell you how great you are. It's our job to rank you. Oh, so why would he do that, Skip? It, show, it shows a size of insecurity to me. That's what it shows to me. Go ahead. <sighs> Tom Brady has the opposite championship record of LeBron what? James. LeBron is lucky to be three and six in the finals. Tom Brady is six and three, and the six came via all fourth quarter comeback game winning drives via Tom Brady. But not once in Tom versus time did he flash back to remember when I did this or remember when I did that. No, he's just trying to show you to enlighten you on how he takes care yes. of his body, how he trains versus the norm. He's shattering the mold with his trainer, Alex Guerrero, they're saying, this is the way we're beating Father Time. It's Tom versus Time. We're openly sharing our method with you, how we do it, that nobody else has ever done it. You should thank him for that, because if you had seen Tom versus Time when you were 35, Shannon, maybe you'd played until you were 40 if you had Alex Guerrero's no. training methods at your fingertips. At, at, in you, front you of your eyes Gronk? so you could drink it all in. Did, did, did you see Gronk? what he get, Gronk? Gronk tried that. And Gronk is now retired with me working for us because he tried Tom versus Time. Julian Edelman. Julian, what did, what did, what did you say? No, 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 Tom, I can't do that. You're back there protected. I got to hit this iron. I got to be protected. See, elasticity works if you're a quarterback. But when you're taking that punishment, you can't, you can't train like that, Skip. Only a quarterback or a kicker or a punter, somebody that's not taking contact on a consistent, regular basis can take this kind of, can train like this. But Skip, no, 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 no. If you great, let us, we don't need to know how you work out. LeBron James, they posted what his trainers do. He's working out too. As a matter of fact, he's working out right now. He's probably right down the street in the, uh, Brentwood. I need to come down out of uh, Bel Air right quick and go holler at him, make sure he's getting the work yeah. in. But you know, I'm practicing social distancing. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to bother the man. I'm not going to, you know, never know who 
people out there breathing and all that kind of stuff. So I'm not going to do that, Skip Bayless. But you need to stop. I want to see this. I demand LeBron James release this immediately. And although Michael Jordan did not commission this, he blessed it. He sat down. Michael Jordan don't sit down for nothing. He sat down and gave them over 100 plus hours of his time. Did he or did he not, Skip Bayless? I have no idea. I don't know. Yes or no? Give hundreds you do of hours. know. I, I, I don't know. I don't know anything about it, honestly. I just know okay, it's a documentary okay, about Bayless. Michael, not made by Michael. Hold up, Skip Bayless. So when you write a book or you do something on a subject, and because the, there sometimes you do a documentary and the subject that you're doing the documentary on wants no part of it because he doesn't like the direction or how he's going to be portrayed. But in this documentary, I've seen footage of Michael Jordan sitting sit down. Now, you told me when you wrote books on Jerry Jones, you spent thousands of hours because he blessed those I books. Did. Now, you don't know if somebody blesses a book blesses a documentary if they sit down or how much time they're willing to give for this. You do know, and I want to get you on record right now, saying that Michael Jordan spent countless hours, hundreds of hours, for this docuseries. I, I don't know. I have no idea. Maybe you got inside you don't know. news that I no, don't have. You Maybe you're breaking get. news here. I, I have no idea. I don't know, honestly. So you don't know if Michael Jordan sat down and gave any of his time. So all it, all of it is secondhand knowledge. It's Scott, it's Scottie Pippen, it's uh, uh, Steve Kerr, it's other people. Michael Jordan was not a participant in this doctor series. Is that what you're telling me? No, I think he participated. I haven't seen the footage you've seen. I just see the ads for it. And I there see Phil have. talking. I see Scotty talking. I assume he sat down for it. But I don't know that he had any editorial control. And to your point about me and Jerry, Jerry, I, I don't know if it's I don't know if it's thousands, but it was hundreds of hours I spent for three books with Jerry Jones. Again, he didn't get a nickel of the proceeds of those books, and he had zero editorial control over what I wrote. He did not see the manuscript before it went to print. So he had no control and he, he got no, he did not benefit financially from those books. So it was just, it was my project on those cowboys and he happened to be the owner general manager and was gracious enough with his time in part because he loves to talk and hear himself talk and be quoted. And I do think that Jerry trusted me enough that he thought I would, would present a fair portrayal of Jerry and the cowboys. And I believe I did in all three books. But but again, we're well, back to Tom versus time. It, it wasn't about his greatest moments. It's it's about his training methods. And to your point, we saw Julian Edelman as they were training up in big sky country, wh whatever, where they're having those off-season workouts with Amendola and Edelman. And Edelman said, no, I don't do what you do. I got to hit that iron, as you said. And look what happened to Edelman last year at age, what was he, 33? And he banged up his shoulder, needed surgery, cracked his ribs, and had a bum knee that, that hobbled him the whole year. So maybe he could have benefited from Alex Guerrero's training methods. Gronk did, no, not, he did not, but Gronk already had a, yeah, Gronk had a serious back injury. He had knee surgery. He had elbow surgery. He had, it seemed like, 15 surgeries before he discovered mm -hmm. the Alex Guerrero training method. I want to see LeBron, and I want to hear the mindset. I want to go inside. Skip, we, you watch, I mean, because that's all I've been doing is watching Netflix and watching all these doctor series and going inside the minds. And I've watched Quincy Jones, and I listen to Miles Davis, and I've said, you know, you know uh, serial killers. I've watched, Skip, I want to know the mind of what's going through his mind in game five, six, and, se five, six, and seven against Golden State. I want to know, what we, because it was he, this is the reason why the Boston Celtics went and got KG, went and got Ray Allen, because they saw what this young man had done to the bad boy Pistons, too. And they said, we can't stop it. We can't do anything with him. We need to call in reinforcements, kind of like what we're doing now to combat this coronavirus. Skip. We got to call in reinforcements. We got to get all this other stuff because we can't contain it. They couldn't contain this man, so they had to go get help. Nobody in the history of the NBA 
has had to have reinforcements called in to stop him like LeBron James. And I want to know what he thinks about that. I need to know. Mm. As a matter of fact, I'm going to get on the phone. Well, as soon as we're done, I'm going to call my homeboy Mav. I'm going to call Rich Paul. And I'm going to call Randy. And we're going to put this project together. Coming to a coming to your uh, streaming service in the very near future. Goat Jane, mm. the documentary. And Shannon Sharp is the fifth horseman in that group. He is now in the inner circle. And yet, here's the last point I'm going to make about this, and then we're going to move on. But my point is, at least Michael Jordan's last big, full, great year, his real year, was 1998 in Chicago. He's been retired for whatever it's been, 20-odd years. So LeBron is still playing. LeBron's team has a chance, a good chance, to win this year's championship. So maybe LeBron should wait until all is said and done before he commissions a documentary about himself. That's all I'm saying. No. No mercy. Now we move on to the NFL draft. Another day, another positive story about Tua. This time he underwent a voluntary medical recheck. This with uh, uh, an NFL-approved doctor in Nashville where Tua is working out. And results were, quote-unquote, overwhelmingly positive, that according to Tua's reps. So, Shannon, are you still sticking with Tua over Joe Burrow? I am, Skip. I believe he'll be a better pro because I've seen more consistency longer. Now, Joe Burrow, Skip, I believe he statistically had the greatest season ever for a player, especially a quarterback. No, we're going to exclude running backs. But for a quarterback, Skip, you don't go 60 and 5 and you beat, what, seven, eight top 10 teams and the consistency week in and week out. But, Skip, remember, it was one year. His junior year, we remember what happened. He was not this. And so I'm, I'm, I'm always, I tend to lean to someone that's did it, that's done it for an extended period of time as opposed to someone that seemingly had a flash in the pan season. Now, Skip, he could turn out to be great, but what we've seen from quarterbacks is that the ones that do it for an extended period of time, the Peyton Mannings, the Andrew Lux, the guys that are starting, Drew Breeses, the Phillip Rivers, the Roethlisberger, even though Roethlisberger came out early, Skip, he was a starter for a number of years. Now, Cam had a great career, even though he only did it one year at the major college level. But more times than not, Skip, when we see guys have those one great college seasons, they don't normally translate, transfer over to the NFL. Skip, you look at Tua as a two-year starter. 76 touchdowns, nine interceptions. Quicker release, better accuracy. Skip, he can make all the throws. And I get, you know, everybody thinks he's injury prone. See, the thing is, Skip, like, in major college sports, and it's going to be like this in the NFL, if you get injured, they're going to try to get you out there as soon as possible, get you to return to the field. And if that means, Skip, well, if you heal up on your own, it'll take you six weeks. We can do this surgery and get you back in four. Which one do you think they're going to opt to opt for? The player and the team. And that's what happens. I believe, you know, hey, he had those ankle injuries. Heal up on their own. It's like, man, the season's going to be over. We need you back out there. We're trying to win a title. He has the tightrope surgery, what, uh, tight rope or whatever it's called, Skip. Had the surgery that helped him get back to the field sooner. So, but for me, Skip... I don't know if he's going to be there at five for the Miami Dolphins, but Skip, they have the ammunition to move up one or two spots. They have, a, they have what, five picks in the first two rounds, and they got four picks next year in the first two rounds. So they have the ammunition to go up maybe one or two spots to ensure themselves of getting a quarterback, Skip. They need a quarterback of the future. And I believe that the, the gap between one, two, and three, four, five, is vast. I would take two. I like Tua as the best quarterback in this draft. But it seems to me, Burrow being from Ohio, Cincinnati has the first pick. It seems like a no-brainer to me. But I would take Tua because I believe he will be the best of the pros in the pros. Okay. I'm going to start with your last point first. And I'm going to say that I've heard several reports, one from Jeff Darlington of ESPN, who I believe is based in Miami, saying that the Dolphins actually favor Burrow over Tua. So the, the issue becomes for the Dolphins, I think, more upside down than you think, which is they have to decide, do they want to pay 
the the supreme freight that would be required to move from five to one to swap places with the Bengals. Because remember, Miami has three first round picks. So would the Bengals take the the fifth pick and then the two next ones down the line to swap from five to one for Burrow? I don't think the Bengals would or should because Joe Burrow is made for them. And I believe Burrow is much better than Tua. And I like Tua. I just don't love him. But you mentioned accuracy. L- listen, I- I've never seen better accuracy than I saw from Joe Burrow last year because I can't remember in any game that I watched from start to finish, and I probably watched six or seven, I don't remember him missing mm-hmm. a single throw, especially down the stretch, starting with the SEC championship game. He did not miss a throw. But before we get to performance, let's talk about durability, because also speaking of ESPN, I heard Rex Ryan say today that his sources around the league, and I'm sure he's got many given his track record, but that he's told Tua has had five surgeries already. Now, to your point, they might have been get get well quicker surgeries, you know, where during the season you got to have your knee scoped, but you don't tell the media so you can take your quote unquote sprained knee and get over it quicker and get back on the football field. But maybe he's had a couple of knee Correct. scopes. I, I don't know. But but for sure, he's had two what's called tightrope surgeries, as you point out, on each ankle. And then he had a very serious career threatening surgery on a fractured hip that, that can derail players and it can make you vulnerable down the line. Apparently, the doctor yesterday and the doctor before that said, hey, He looks 100% to those two doctors. So God bless him because he's a good kid. He's a a spiritual kid. He's hugely liked in the locker room. I have no doubt about his leadership skills, but there's something about Joe Burrow that, that I like even more as a leader because this guy's got swagger to him. This guy has got an attitude. The first time I noticed this guy was when they were playing Texas on that Saturday night. I started watching the game and I couldn't turn it off because I thought mm-hmm. Texas was really good at that point. And they turned out to be pretty good, but Joe Burrow destroyed them. That night he threw for 471, 31 of 39, four touchdowns and had a 92 QBR. And at the end of the game, I see him over on the sidelines pointing at Longhorn fans up in the stands saying, I shut you up and I shut you up and I shut you up. And I'm like, whoa, can you back that up? Well, he went to Florida and backed that up with a 98 QBR. And then you you know what happened at Tuscaloosa? He had a 97 QBR. That day, too, had a 73 QBR. So he dramatically outplayed him at Tuscaloosa. Then Georgia in the SEC game. He has a 97 QBR, again, scaled 0 to 100. That was four touchdowns and no interceptions. And then he absolutely annihilated my Oklahoma Sooners for 493 and seven touchdowns. Also ran for a touchdown, no interceptions. 99 QBR, almost perfect. Clemson, the national championship game, he had a 98 QBR. So just on the games from the SEC championship through the, the final He was 16 touchdowns to no interceptions and and an average QBR of 98 scale of zero to 100. That's off the charts. That's never been done. That's all time, all time. I I thought going back to the Baker Mayfield year, he had the greatest year I'd ever seen. Then I thought Kyler had the greatest year on top of Baker. And now it's Joe Burrow. And I don't see anything not to like about a six foot four inch quarterback. But the thing is, Skip, you mentioned that one season. He did play his junior year, right? When he was awful. Yep. He was awful. Now, Tua has put together, you know, yep. he came in, he played a little bit when Jalen Hurts, uh, his, as a true freshman, I think Jalen Hurts was a uh, was a sophomore, and he came in and when Jalen Hurts would they'd have a big lead, and he would come in the game and he would throw his touchdown. And you're like, okay, yeah. But, I didn't, Skip, I didn't know he was this good. You know, I just thought, okay, everybody got their backups in. He's Alabama. Alabama backup should be better than the teams they're playing backup, rightfully so. It wasn't, Skip, until he got into that national championship game against Georgia, and you watch him spin the football, you're like, this kid is special. And the way, the throw that he made to uh, uh, Devontae Smith, where he holds the safety and he throws the ball on the rail and gets covered too. Now, obviously, Skip, it was a blown coverage because the, uh, the corner should have kept sinking 
and the safety should have split, but hey, they didn't. That's neither here nor there. But he did a great job of staring the safety down and throwing the ball to the rail. If what you've seen over the last two years haven't, hasn't impressed you about Tua, Skip, you're never going to be impressed. 76 mm. and 9. That's even better than Joe Burrow. Okay, but Shannon, in some of the biggest yes. games, I was not impressed. I thought he lost his poise. I thought he started to unravel. You can blame it on injury in that first SEC championship game against Georgia 2018. He hurt his knee early in the game. I don't know what was exactly wrong with it, but he was 10 of 25 for 164 and two interceptions, had a QBR of only 29. Mm -hmm. That's when he got replaced in the fourth quarter, yanked in favor of Jalen Hurts, who outscored <clears throat> Georgia 14 to nothing in the fourth and brought them back and saved the season and won that game for them. Then against Clemson National Championship game, Tua was two interceptions and a 59 QBR. And then I mentioned the game against LSU this year. He threw for 418, it was pretty good, but he missed so many throws in that game. He, it was 21 of 40, and I thought he was off target much of the time. So I, look, he now, had Belichick two defense. receivers. Yeah, go ahead. Coach Belichick defense let him down. Isn't that what you always tell me when Tom Brady has monster days and they lose? It's the defense. Coach Saban defense let him down. Mm. I think Joe Burrow mm -hmm. showed him up. And remember, <laughs> yeah. listen, Tua had two receivers in Judy and Ruggs who are going to go in the top 15 of the draft. And you mentioned Devontae Smith. And then there's Jalen Waddell, who are both there. They both could be first-round picks before all is said and done. Uh -huh. So that's yep. that's an unbelievable – you talk about the four horsemen that he was throwing to. And I give you, Burrow had four good ones himself. But I don't think they were quite yeah. as good as those four. So I, I don't know. I'm, I'm afraid those receivers might have helped make Tua as much as Tua was making himself. So in the end, Shannon, I, I just don't know. Joe Burrow, I, I give you it was just one year, but it wasn't just a one-hit wonder. It was game after game after game after game after game. I've never seen such a sustained streak of excellence from a college quarterback before. And he did stay healthy. He did take a lot of punishment. He is durable. He's not brittle. He's not fragile the way Tua appears he could be going forward into pro football. I just think Tua is high risk. Well, hey, hold on, Skip. He did, I think he broke his wrist or he broke his arm. Remember, that's what held him back at Ohio State. He got, he broke something that, that and he ended ago. up losing the yeah. job and that's why he transferred. Okay, but I, like two, I didn't even mention he broke his finger on his, on his left hand, his throwing hand. He had a badly pulled quad. It just seemed like it was one thing after another. No mercy. I apologize if you've heard barking during today's show here on Undisputed. That's my little daughter, my little Maltese Hazel, who is watching the show downstairs here at our home with my wife, Ernestine. And Ernestine has told me that Hazel is really getting angry with Shannon today and she just can't contain herself. <laughs> so as she watches and Shannon raises his voice against me, Hazel barks at the TV trying to get Shannon to calm down. So Shannon, be warned, Hazel is on the war path today <laughs> over you. That means so I'm let's winning. See if Anytime Hazel, Hazel can starts barking, down. that's a yeah, win for me. Yeah. Okay, that is a win. I agree, you won that one. So <laughs> here we go. Let's see how Hazel responds to this one. I found these quotes from the GM of the Bills, Brandon Bean, to be very interesting if you really break them down. Here's what Brandon Bean said. The team to beat in the East is the Patriots. As long as Bill Belichick's there, you're talking about probably the greatest head coach of all time that was paired with the greatest quarterback of all time. So until we beat them, we've done nothing. And then Brandon Bean added, that it's quote unquote comical to write off the Patriots and Bill Belichick. So Shannon Sharp, I ask you, is it comically dangerous to ignore Bill Belichick at this point? Absolutely. Because what Coach Belichick is all, Skip, if you look at 
what he's done in this tenure in New England. How many times do we think in his 20-year reign as the head coach, the Patriots had the best roster? Top to bottom, they had the best roster. Coach Belichick has a way of getting the maximum out of his players, especially when they come into the fold. Now, he's taking players that weren't very good at other places. We had no idea. Skip, I didn't even know Kyle Van. I didn't know who Kyle Van Oy was. But he gets there, and he turns into, turns him into a player. He goes and gets a big payday for Miami. Jamie Collins knew who he was. He goes to Cleveland, and he falls off a cliff. He comes back, and for the first part of the last year, he's in the defensive player of the year running. Stephon Gilmore was good, but Stephon Gilmore wasn't what he is now. Skip, the thing that really good coaches can do is that they set a, they set the temperature, they set the gauge of how they're gonna how things are gonna be done and how we're gonna play. They call it playing to a standard. Coach Belichick has set the standard. It doesn't matter who comes, it doesn't matter who goes. We play how we play. And although Tom Brady is no longer there, and he's a great historically transcendent great player, that doesn't change how they're going to play. Now, it might affect the outcome of how many games they actually win, but you play to the standard. And Miami and Buffalo have something what we call now, Skip, expectations. Nobody expected Buffalo to make the playoffs. Now we expect them to make the playoffs because they did it last year, and the quarterback has another year up under his belt. Nobody expect to see, especially Miami, after they started trading away all their best players, Minka Fitzpatrick, Laramie Tunsil, they got rid of some of their players, and then they, they started out terrible, and then all of a sudden, they beat Philly down the stretch, they beat New England down the stretch. So now they have expectations with all those draft picks. So, right, absolutely, the New England Patriots are still the beast of the AFC East. Mm. So I'm going to reread part of this quote to you, Mr. Sharp. And the, the part that caught okay. my eye was, as long as Bill Belichick's there, you're talking about probably the greatest head coach of all time. That was paired with the greatest quarterback of all time. Well, all those players went from nowhere to everywhere in New England, in large part because they had the greatest quarterback ever. And now, the last time I checked, Tom Brady is, is wearing pewter, the color of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. He is no longer in Foxborough. There's no longer a security blanket for Bill Belichick to fall back on when he tyrannically treats his players the way no coach in the modern era could get away with treating players, but because Tom Brady was his buffer in the locker room, his strong leader, his all-time great leader, Bill could get away with any old cog. He could, he could run players out of town, my way or the highway, and mix and match players in the offensive line or on defense or even at the skill spots and get away with it because he had the greatest quarterback of all time. Once you take that away, let alone they've lost 10 starters, including Tom Brady. And I, the, the last time I checked, Bill Belichick's done next to nothing in free agency. It's shocking how little he's done. The biggest move he made was to, to tag Joe Tooney. Jo, uh, Joe, what? what are you he's, he's an offensive guard, and you tagged him? <laughs> and you, Okay, so you kept Devin McCourty. Not bad. That was two years at $23 million. You kept the great special teams player, Matthew Slater. You added another very good special teams uh, uh, player in uh, Adrian Phillips from the Chargers. I'll, I'll give you those, but they're special teams. So he signed Bo mm -hmm. Allen, the immortal, and Demir Bird, the other immortal, as his two big free agency pickups outside of Brian Hoyer, who he brought back for the third time. And this is Brian's 10th NFL stop. I, I guess to either compete with Jared Stidham or maybe to start over him, maybe just to back him up. But uh, Jeff Howe, who covers for The Athletic, and, and he's covered the Patriots for the last 11 years, he reported two days ago that the Patriots have shown no interest in Cam Newton or in acquiring Andy Dalton. 
So, the, the, and, and Jeff Howe points out, they don't have the salary cap space to go after either if they're going to command any kind of a contract. And Andy Dalton still has a, a right. year left on his contract. So the point is, it looks like, by all accounts, they're going forward with Jared Stidham in his second year, a guy who got yanked last year in a, in a preseason game in favor of Tom having to go back in the game because Jared Stidham was so bad. And I've told you, I watched a lot of Jared Stidham at Baylor and at Auburn. And in the biggest games, in the brightest lights, I thought he went deer in headlights. I thought he lost some of his poise. He's athletic. He's got a nice arm. He ain't Tom Brady. And when you've lost that many starters and made that few of additions, and then you have you have some draft capital, you got the 23rd overall pick, and then you've got three thirds, four six, and two sevenths. But can you parlay them into a player of magnitude? Again, Mel Kuyper originally had Jordan Love going to Belichick at number 23, and now Mel is saying, well, gee, he's starting to hear rumblings, as Todd McShay is, that, that Jordan Love will go way up. And, and Todd McShay has Jordan Love going at six to the L.A. Chargers. So, again, I'm saying on paper right now, as great as Bill Belichick is, he wanted the opportunity to prove that he could do it without Tom Brady. Well, this looks like a complete rebuild to me this year. And if if he goes eight and eight with this roster, he should be the coach of the year because I, I, I just can't see it. I, I don't get what's left here that would make you say that they're going to win the East because I, I don't think this is an East winning roster without Tom Brady. Bill Belichick is what I'm going to say is the reason why they're going to win the, NFC, the AFC East. But let me ask you this, Skip. You said now that Tom, that Coach Belichick doesn't have Tom Brady to bail him out. What about Tom and all those top five and top ten defenses that he had the luxury of being propped up behind? What's he going to do now, Skip Bayless? What is he going to do now? He is going to have the benefit of Todd Bowles as his defensive coordinator. And I think Todd Bowles might not quite be Belichick, but he's really good at what he does. And Shaq, what's that? Skip, really? I mean, come on now. I understand that Coach Belichick might have rubbed a lot of people the wrong way, but his defensive expertise is unquestioned and should be unchallenged, unmatched, unrivaled by anybody past or present. Okay, I, I got you. But Todd Bowles, I think, is underrated as a coordinator, and he's got the leading sacker in the league coming back in Shaq Barrett, and they mm -hmm. have talent on defense. They re-signed Sue, and that defense got put in the worst field position, that uh, inherited field position of any team in the league last year because Jameis threw seven pick sixes to start with, but he turned it over 35 total times, which was... The, the, the worst by 12 turnovers in the league. So the defense kept getting quick change, you know, sudden change, thrown, 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 and it wore them down and out. I think this defense is much better with Tom Brady than it would have been with, you know, obviously going forward with Jameis Winston and his high turnover rate. So oh, I, I think they're going to be just fine well, on defense. Well, well, Coach Belichick says, what about my defense giving us great field position? And Tom, you going three and out. And you're not doing anything. Uh, what, what are we going to do about that, Tom? What are we going to do about those pick sixes that you've been throwing? We're going to talk about that because you know you threw one. You're supposed to have two against Tennessee. And Logan dropped one. But he got the last one. What are we going to do about that pick six that Eric Rowe picked off against Miami? What about what are we going to do about that, Skip? Because we were number one in defense the entire season. Number one. And what we got to show for it? The great, the GOAT. You tell me, GOAT. GOAT. What we got to show for that, Skip? If we don't score more than seven, if we can't, if we give up more than 17, we lose. Mm. And we won three games in which you yeah, only is. scored 17. Beat the Cowboys, beat the Eagles. Stop it. Buffalo. No, you stop it. Over the last eight games of the year, go back and look it up. Belichick's defense fell off the cliff, starting with that Sunday night game at Lamar Jackson and ending with that home game against the rival Dolphins who were starting to come to life. But they had them beaten thanks to Brady's 
Once again, fourth quarter, comeback, touchdown, what looked like game-winning drive, three and a half minutes left, 24 to 20, Patriots, and Belichick's defense allowed Ryan Fitzpatrick to go 80 yards in 13 plays and not score a field goal, but have to score a touchdown to knock them out of the two seed. That was all-time pathetic, and Belichick, thanks in large part to you, gets a pass for that because nobody seemed to be watching that his all-time historically great defense had fallen off the cliff over the second half of the year. And I say good luck to you going forward with what's left of that defense. Well, the defense might have fallen off a cliff the last half of the season. The only reason the offense didn't fall off a cliff because they didn't climb. There was nowhere for them to fall. So at least they were, the defense was way up here, and they failed some. They still finished number one. Your offense never even got up on the mountain to fall. Mm. My offense mm-hmm. was last in the league in stunk. receiver of uh, in receiver separation. Yeah, they all stunk because mm-hmm. they stunk. The, the talent around Brady stunk. So I, I think we still have a bet. Don't we? Didn't we bet the other day yes, five yes. cases of Diet do? Yes. I said Tampa Bay's record will be better than Belichick's record without Tom Brady. And I'm, I'm feeling OK about that right now. Do, would you like I'll give you a chance right now. Would you like to back out of it? No. Hmm. Big N, big okay, O. Good. That would be put it like this. A hard no. No mercy. My man Shannon Sharp tells me that Des Bryant has now taken down the picture that he posted of himself and Dak and some other receivers at a workout with their arms draped around each other, social no distancing. Shannon and I criticized the picture earlier in the show, and maybe Des was watching Undisputed as he often has in the past. So we appreciate that, Des Bryant. Now, speaking of Des Bryant, let's talk some Dallas Cowboys because Fox Bet has set the over-under on Cowboy victories next year at 9.5, nine and a half wins. So I ask you, Cowboy hater Shannon Sharp, how far under nine and a half are you going to predict? Half. <laughs> Did I win? Skip, man, I, I just wish they would have postponed this extra, I don't really like the extra playoff game, the extra playoff game scale, but hey, it is what it is. I just wish they'd have implemented it next year. So after the 2021 season, but it's gonna go in this year because the Cowboys would have missed the playoff. They don't win nine. You know what, Skip? Let me I'm gonna get back to my point. They're not winning 10 games. That's for certain. Now, Travis Frederick. Now, in the three years in which Dak had Travis Frederick, he averaged getting sacked 27 times a season. The one year without Travis Frederick, he got sacked 56 times. Now, hmm, have they replaced him yet, Skip? No, we'll get back to that in a minute. They lost their best corner in Byron Jones. Have they replaced him? No, we'll get back to that in a second. What about Randall Cobb, slot receiver? Nope. Robert Quinn, oh yeah, they did. They got a guy that hadn't played in four years and a guy that hadn't played in two and a half years trying to replace Robert Quinn, who was your top sacker last year. Hmm. Mention now they got Eagles twice. They got the 49ers at home, gonna be good. Vikings on the road, bust them up last year. Seattle on the road, we know what Russ does in that building. Steelers at home, Falcons at home, Rams on the road. Mm, you're not making the playoffs, Skip. Eight and eight won't do it, even with the mm. extra playoff spot. Mm. And this is why it's gonna hurt you so much, even with the extra playoff spot. You sorry rascals are going to miss the playoffs again. Mm. So did I just hear Shannon Sharp predict eight and eight next year for the Cowboys? Eight and eight. Eight and eight. Okay. I I got you on record. Shannon Sharp says eight and eight for next year's Cowboys. So. I'm going to go 10 wins. I I thought about 11, but I'm going to be conservative because they have suffered some big losses. (laughs) I'm going to go 10 wins, and I'm going to start with this premise. I still believe that my team is good enough within the NFC East to beat the Giants twice and the Redskins twice 
and the Eagles in Dallas or at Jerry World. So that's five wins right right there on the way to what I say will be 10 wins. And then I look at the home slate and they have Arizona. I think that's a win. I think they can beat the Cleveland Browns. This is in Dallas. I think so. The Steelers will be Mm -hmm. tough, but you could you could argue they could win that game. And then the Atlanta Falcons, I'm I'm pretty sure they can win that game at home. I'm not positive of any of those games. I just say there's four games. And if I give them four out of five, I'm all you know, that's vaulting me all the way up to uh, to uh, nine already on the road at Seattle. No, I don't think so. Um, Maybe the Rams, maybe they could win on at the Rams. I don't think the Rams are going to be that good next year. Vikings will be tough, but they you, you said they got the brakes beat off of them. It was 28 to 24, and if they just let Dak have the football in his hands, they would have won that game. They do get to play at Cincinnati. So there's one road win. When I I, I say they can win <laughs> at Cincinnati for sure, and they the other road games at Baltimore, that's that's hard. But if I just give oh, them the oh, you'll be more home games, non division. Yeah. Okay. No, I'm saying you okay. will beat Baltimore. You giving them that win at Baltimore? Home games. No. Okay. No, I said no. And and I'll just say, okay. what if they just win one road non-division game? One, and that would be at Cincinnati. I still think they could beat the Rams at the Rams. Get even for that playoff game two years ago out here in L.A. at the Coliseum. Now it's <laughs> going to be in SoFi. Uh, I, okay. Even if they just beat Cincinnati, that would get them by my count to ten wins. And you would be be in trouble again and have to eat a lot of crow. But I still say, as I told you earlier in the show, they have made the defense better. Because when you go Gerald McCoy and Dontari Poe and maybe Alden Smith slash Randy Gregory in place of Robert Quinn, but then you add in the secondary, Mm -hmm. ha-ha Clinton Dix, who's a much better cover safety than Jeff Heath ever thought about being. Then you get Leighton Van Der Esch, Wolf Hunter, you get him back. And, and all of a sudden I say, okay, the defense is a little better than it was last year. It's a little stouter against the run. It's a little more experienced. It's a little more savvy. And Demarcus Lawrence has to have a better year than he had last year when he did not live up to his hundred million. Now, if I look on offense, they led the league in yards last year, but they're not as good right here, right now on offense as they were last year. I give you that, but still, can Zeke play at a higher level than he did last year? I would hope so, because he didn't live up to his 90 million contract. And can Amari at least give me one or two road games, maybe at Cincinnati? Could he at least stay on the field for the whole game and catch five for 85, maybe? I, I would think so. He's got his $100 million deal. Maybe he can start to live up to it. Maybe the pressure will be off him now. So I still say this is a good football team. That kid they drafted out of Penn State, that Connor McGovern, not Connor Williams, can play center because he played it at Penn State. So maybe he starts over Joe Looney at center. And maybe the offensive line is is good, but not great. I still say this team is good enough to win 10 games. So I'll just go conservatively 10 and I'll take barely the over 9.5. See, the, the problem is, Skip, is that you guys never win any games that you shouldn't win. So the likelihood of you going somewhere where like, oh, it's a tough game and you should you shouldn't win that and you win it. You always lose the game you're supposed to lose. But what has transpired with Dallas over the last couple of years, you always lose a game that you should win a la the Jets, a la the Eagles when they're down, a la the Saints when they don't have Drew Brees. You guys always lose games that you probably should win, and you never win games you probably shouldn't. (laughs) (laughs) Well, let me throw this back at you and kick you right in the stomach with this one. One big reason that we blew some games we should have won last year was the kicker. The kicker, Brett the Fret Maher, by any metric, by any standard, was the worst kicker in pro football last year, and he's gone. And they were going to replace him with Kai Forbath, as they did at the end of the year last year, and he was not bad, but all of a sudden, Greg the Leg became available. And all of a sudden, as as you know, John Fossil, who coached Greg Zerline with the Rams as a special Mm -hmm. teams coach, is now with the Cowboys. 
bones, as they call him. You know him. And the point is, I know him they, well. they went out and paid a little more money to get Greg the leg, you know, Legatron. And, and again, he was not great last year, but he's been great before that. And he's got to be much better than Brett the Fret was. So if I show you the games like Jets, where he misses field goals that cost them a, the, the game in which they lost 24 to 22, what if Zerline is the difference in two wins next year? You will be in big trouble. I've got a real kicker. But Skip, you guys were 8-8 eight eight last year with a stack roster, and you've lost key pieces. Do you believe the guys that you signed makes you exponentially better than what you were last year? A guy that hadn't played in four years, a guy that play, hadn't played in two and a half years, you haven't replaced Byron Jones, you haven't replaced uh, Randall Cobb, you lost Travis Frederick at the, at the last second, but have you replaced him? With what? Okay, okay, remember... We have the 17th overall pick. Right now, Todd McShay has C.J. Henderson, the Florida corner, who I like a lot, falling to 17. I'll take that because he'd plug right in for Byron Jones and start. And I promise you, he will intercept more passes than Byron Jones ever thought about because in five years, Byron Jones <laughs> intercepted two passes and rarely got his hands on any balls to knock them down. So maybe a rookie corner, I know it's a lot to ask, but maybe it's even a slight mm -hmm. upgrade when it comes to ball hawking, when it comes to taking away, which the Dallas defense did not do last year. Who knows who could fall? If C.D. Lamb, as Mel Kuyper thinks, falls to 17, if you give me C.D. Lamb, then you're in even bigger trouble because he is a game breaker and a difference maker. Man, y'all ain't getting no C.D. Lamb. Y'all, go, you're going to be eight and eight like you already are, always are. And then I wonder who you're going to blame now. Because you know you blamed it for the last three or four years. You got to blame Red, Jason Garrett. Who are you going to blame now that he's not there? Who's going to get the blame, Skip? The only man who could be blamed is Dak Prescott if he decides to hold out because he's franchise tagged mm -hmm. as opposed to getting his long-term deal. Hold out, so Dak. that's the, the only X factor is, will Dak be there? So I think he will be there. I think my team will be there enough to win 10 games. And now let's change the subject completely. No mercy. New Mississippi State coach Mike Leach apologized yesterday for a since-deleted tweet that showed a meme of a woman knitting her husband a noose during self-quarantine. Uh, excuse me, Leach's caption was, after two weeks of quarantine with her husband, Gertrude decided to knit him a scarf, unquote, in tweet. Several of the Mississippi State players expressed via social media their dislike of said tweet, and Leach then apologized via tweet yesterday saying, I sincerely regret if my choice of images in my tweets were found offensive. Shannon Sharp, your reaction. Bill, Skip, let this sink in. This dum dumb is in the state of Mississippi, and he thinks it's okay to tweet an image of a noose, and he says, if someone found this offensive, Skip, when in the last 50 years, I'm just going back 50 years, has a noose been acceptable? Skip, this is what rubs me about Mike Leach and always have since I've known about him. He will always say or do something dumb. Now remember, Skip, I think it was 2018, he tweeted an altered video of President Obama and he kept doubling down and kept doubling down and kept doubling down until eventually he, he ended up retweeting the actual video that was not doctored. Mike Leach, you think you're slick, bro, but you're not. You're in Mississippi and you think it's OK because what? You're the coach of Mississippi State? It's OK for you to tweet that image? Your players have, a, have now, you've made it abundantly clear. Skip, you don't make those mistakes. Me, as a male in America, I know what's offensive to different races of people. I would never tweet or never say, because I know. Mike Leach is a grown man, 
has a, has a degree and he didn't know that a noose, forget, skip, forget being, but in Mississippi, given its history of lynchings and Emmett Till, and you don't know that, Mike Leach? That's a fireable offense. Mm. Real talk, all the way, 100. That's a fireable offense. Mm. And if they weren't so dismal, they would fire it. Mm. I appreciate everything you just said. I know Mike Leach can be kooky, but that not in any way, shape, or form excuses him from this blunder. And this is what gets me, Shannon, about a coach who boasts about being an expert on everything 18th century pirates, Blackbeard and all the pirates of that era. So you know all about that, mm -hmm. Mike Leach, but you're so tone deaf when it comes to, to me, the single most evil symbol of the slavery period in this country, and, and you think it's cute to tweet it, and you're so tone deaf in your mind that, that you have no idea that's going to offend people, especially who play for you on your football team in the state of yes. Mississippi? Are you kidding me? Where have you been? Well, I can tell you where he's been, he grew up in a little town called Cody in Wyoming. Then he went to BYU. Then he went to law school at Pepperdine. And he's the rare coach who I don't even think he played high school football. And he talked his way on to one coaching staff, on to another and another. And all of a sudden, he's the coordinator at Oklahoma because he had a mind for the passing game. And he got the head coaching job at Texas Tech. And they had some success. They pulled off some big wins over the Oklahoma Sooners. But he got crossways with a man I knew very well and Craig James during that period over his son Adam who played for Texas Tech. And it blew up in everybody's face. And Mike Leach was relieved of his duties, but he went to Washington State and he won two-time Pac-12 Coach of the Year. And finally, he winds up at Mississippi State in the SEC. And Shannon, he's in a new place. He, he's in a whole different part of the country in a different league. And I don't think they're going to sit still for this one. So he is at least on the hot seat. And I'm with you. Um, again, most, most people in charge, especially in the SEC, would not let that go by. That would be a fireable offense. So I think I'm hearing you Absolutely. call for his job right now. You're right? Absolutely. Ab absolutely. You, can't, you can't make that kind of mistake, Skip. And the thing is, the greatest apology is change behavior. And he has not learned anything. Mm. Maybe he's not putting kids in, 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 in tool sheds, or maybe he's not doing what he did that got relieved of his duty, but yeah. he keeps making these little, these little under, this little undercurrent suggestions, right. Skip. And, but you can't, Skip, this one, of all things, of where we are now in America. Now, even though we have the, uh, the coronavirus going on, Skip, we're still a very divided country. Mm -hmm. We know that. Everybody knows that. And he thinks it's key, key, key. He thinks it's funny. And then, Skip, the part that yeah. got me, if, if, Skip, really? You still don't, you don't, oh, well, if I, if I followed, instead of just saying, guys, I was wrong, I did this, yada, yada, yada. Yeah. You said, if you offended. What? Man, that is a fireable offense. No, I don't want to, he learned his lesson, he made him, no, 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 no. You, some mistakes, you get a second chance at another job, but not at this one. Yep. Okay, and this is on top of the fact that this is part of his resume, Shannon. I remind you that mm -hmm. back in 2003, he read Donald Trump's book, How to Get Rich. He cold called Donald Trump in New York and went to visit him. They hit it off. They became buddies. He endorsed him, supported him, stumped for him in 2016. And then during the impeachment proceedings, he defended Donald Trump. So, so that's just part mm -hmm. of who he is and, and who he's been. And on top of that, mm -hmm. this happens. That is a really bad look for the new head coach in Starkville, Mississippi. Yeah. Skip, I, I, I want to go there. But yeah, I, I knew that. Like I said, there, there's a little, there's, there's a little thing that he tried. What he tried to do, Skip, he tried to stip, uh, stick his toe over. 
He don't want to jump fully over there, but he just wants to do just a little bit to let a certain element of people know that I'm with you. I'm with you over here. You know I got to be a head coach, so I can't go all the way over there, but I'm with you. He think he's slick, but you're not slick to me, bro. You needs to go. No mercy. Let's take it home. Tom Brady is set to appear on Howard Stern Show next Wednesday, and Tom tweeted yesterday, warm weather, Tom lets loose. Let's do this at Howard Stern, followed by two laughing emojis. Shannon Sharp, are you surprised Tom Brady's going to do the Stern Show? Skip Bayless, first of all, this is going to be uh, Howard Stern's least appealing interview ever. Skip, you know when you go on that show, you talk about maybe some of your sexual partners you've had, maybe you pass gas into a microphone. Does anybody expect Tom Brady to be off-brand? Tom Brady has a brand to protect. He will protect that at all costs. He's just going to go on there, yeah, I had great time, I had great teammates, I had great coaches, yada, yada, yada. He's not going to do anything that we know Howard Stern, people that go on Howard Stern to be about. Now, obviously, you know, some politicians go on there and they have to be buttoned up. But we don't expect Tom Brady to say anything interesting, do we? I don't. <clears throat> Shannon Sharp, do you realize Tom Brady what? just grew up and left home for the first time? Do you realize that he's out from under the tyrannical rule of Bill Belichick and his iron-fisted rule? Do you realize that he's always been a huge fan of Howard Stern's to the po point that he once took a tour of Howard Stern's studio? So he, he, this is huge for him. He's always only done interviews, as you know, with Jim Gray. And Jim's asked him a lot of tough questions, but not personal probing questions like Howard will. Thank and you. I think Tom Brady is about to let down his hair. Bet he doesn't. Bet he doesn't. Skip, that's, the skip, that's not he him. Does. He's not going to give you into it. He's not going to give you anything interesting, especially about the situation with his oldest son's mother. He's not going to talk about that. He's not going to talk about anything interesting, Skip. He's too buttoned up. Skip, it's like me. When I first got off to college, I was a member saying, I am not going to iron. I'm not going to do anything that my grandmother that I had to do when I was in my grandmother's house. Lo and behold, I get to college. I did everything that I did at my grandmother's house because I had done it for so long. He's been buttoned up for so long. It's all he knows. To be golly, gee whiz, Tommy. No. Nope. Tom Brady is about to have some fun, and I wish I had more time to talk about that. I had so much more to say, but we're out of time. I want to thank Michael Vader for making this show fly over the last two weeks here in my house. Remember, we're on 10 to noon Eastern, Monday on FS1. Please stay strong, please stay safe, and please stay home.